Hi guys, it's me, Professor D, and welcome back to my channel. On this video, I'm going to be covering pre-operative nursing. So I'm going to be covering all of the nursing interventions, the things you need to be watching out for, what you're going to be teaching the patient before they go into surgery. So you guys know what I'm about to say, guys. If you haven't done so already, make sure that you do what? Like and subscribe below. Uh, be sure to press that notification button so that you'll be notified every time a new video is released. If you appreciate the content that I'm bringing to this channel, if you appreciate my teaching, please encourage me. How are you gonna encourage me? Share, share my videos. And of course, you guys can leave me a message uh, below or comment if there's anything that you'd like to see me cover that I haven't done so already and I'll put it on my list and I'll make sure that I make a video for you. So without any further ado guys, let's get started. First question. During the preoperative interview, a patient scheduled for an elective hysterectomy tells the nurse, I'm afraid that I will die in surgery like my mother did. Which response by the nurse is most appropriate? A. Tell me more about what happened to your mother. B, you will receive medications to reduce your anxiety. C, you should talk to your doctor again about the surgery. D, surgical techniques have improved a lot in recent years. And the correct answer is A, tell me more about what happened to your mother. Okay, first of all, um, when you're telling the patient, tell me more, obviously you're encouraging them to express their feelings, right? You always want patients to express their feelings, their doubts, their concerns, whenever they bring something up that's bothering them. Let's look at our other choices. B, you'll receive medications to reduce your anxiety. So you're not even going to explore that patient's feelings. You're not even gonna give them a chance to talk about um, what's bothering them. Choice C, you should talk to your doctor again about the surgery. First of all, we never pass the buck, right? The patient's telling you they have concerns. You are going to be the one to talk to them, right? You don't even know if the patient's concerns is about the surgery itself because you haven't asked any questions yet. You haven't even allowed that patient to talk. You're just punting them over to the doctor. So that's wrong. Then you have choice D, surgical techniques have improved in a lot in recent years. You don't even know if the technique is what the patient's concerned about because you haven't allowed them time to express their feelings. So B, C, and D are wrong. A is the correct answer. You want that patient to express their anxiety. And there's another reason why A is the correct answer. Um, our biggest indicator that a patient may have an adverse effect to surgery, specifically anesthesia that's used during surgery, is if they've had a bad reaction before or a first degree relative such as a mother or a father has had a bad reaction before. So when this patient says they're scared they're gonna die like their mother, whoa, well, let's talk about this. What are your concerns? What happened to your mother? Because you may find out some information that's important that we didn't know before that you have to relate to the physician so that you have to allow the patient a chance to talk, okay? Because while they're talking, you're doing what? You're listening and you're cluing in on important details that you may not have known before that may alert you that they may be a potential problem. Next question. A patient arrives to ambulatory surgery center for a scheduled outpatient surgery. Which information is of most concern to the nurse? A, the patient has not had outpatient surgery before. B, the patient's planning to drive home after surgery. C, the patient's insurance does not cover outpatient surgery. Or D, the patient has a glass of water, patient had a glass of water a few hours before arriving. Now I'll give you a moment to think of your answer. And the correct answer is B, that this patient thinks after surgery that they're gonna drive home. Absolutely not. Why? Because when you have surgery, you get what? Anesthesia. You think that it's gonna be safe for that patient to drive home? When you're driving, that's operating heavy equipment, driving a car, right? That means cognitively you have to be intact 100%, not under um, any mind-altering drugs such as anesthesia. So that needs to be addressed because that patient cannot drive themselves home. Someone needs to drive them home. Okay. Remember when it comes to test questions for nursing, we don't care about money. So that patient's not having um, insurance. That's not our concern. Our concern is the patient. We, um, when it comes to surgery, if the patient had a clear liquid such as water, just a few hours, up to three hours before surgery, that's okay. Surgery is not going to be canceled. 
okay studies have shown that patients having um fluids with up to three hours um before surgery it doesn't increase their risk of aspiration. So that's not going to be our greatest concern. Our greatest concern is that patient that thinks after being under anesthesia that they're going to be able to operate heavy equipment such as a vehicle and drive themselves home. No, safety is our first priority in this question. A patient who's scheduled for surgery in a week tells the nurse doing the procedure the, the preoperative assessment about an allergy to bananas, kiwi, and latex products. Which action is most important for the nurse to take? A, notify the dietitian about food allergies. B, alert surgery center about the latex allergy. C, reassure the patient that all allergies are noted in the medical record. Or D, ask whether the patient uses antihistamines to reduce allergic reactions. And the correct answer is B, alert the surgery center about the latex allergy. That is what's most important. And usually, you know, the, the test writer for this question was very kind, right? They let you know about the latex allergy. But usually when I see test questions, it's just about the patient being allergic to bananas, kiwi, avocado, and they expect you to know that if they're allergic to these fruits, that same protein that's in these fruits is also the same protein that's in what? Latex. And they expect you to know that the patient most likely can have a latex allergy. In this question, they were kind just to add latex on there. But you need to know that those types of fruits have the same protein that latex, um, latex gloves has, okay? So the most important thing for you to do, and I don't care even if it's, let's say it's already documented in the chart, we need to make sure so you are going to be proactive and you're going to let this team, the surgery center team and everybody that's working on the patient that may potentially touch the patient, let them know that that patient has a latex allergy so everyone knows they need to wear non-latex gloves. During the preoperative assessment of a patient scheduled for a colon resection, the patient tells the nurse about using St. John's warts to prevent depression. The nurse should alert the staff in the post-anesthesia recovery area that the patient may A, experience increased pain, B, have hypertensive episodes, C, take longer to recover from anesthesia, or D, have more post-operative bleeding than expected. And the correct answer, guys, is C, take longer to recover from anesthesia. St. John's wards, yes, it's... um a uh, uh, great herb that's used is over-the-counter herb that some patients, some patients use for depression. But what it also does, it prolongs the amount of time that anesthesia stays in the body. Okay. So if this patient was taking St. John's warts, you must notify the PACU, the post anesthesia um, unit that this patient has St. John's warts in their body, so the anesthesia will most likely stay in the patient's body longer, which means it's going to take longer for that patient to recover from the effects of the anesthesia. Choices A, B, and D, St. John's warts doesn't cause any of these, okay? So your correct answer is C. On the day of surgery, the nurse is admitting a patient with a history of cigarette smoking. Which action is most important at this time? A, auscultate for adventitious breath sounds. B, ask whether the patient has smoked recently. C, remind the patient about harmful effects of smoking. Or D, calculate the cigarette smoking history and pack years. And the correct answer, guys, is A, auscultate for adventitious breath sounds. So guess what? If that patient's a smoker, you know what smoking does to the lungs. And it makes patients... Um, at increased risk for respiratory infections, such as what? Pneumonia. Can a patient get surgery if they have an infection? No, they cannot have surgery if they have an active infection. So if that patient's a smoker, it would make sense for us to check, <coughs> excuse me, their lungs. We're gonna listen for adventitious breath sounds. Adventitious breath sounds are bad, 
right? Such as wheezing, strider, those are bad. We want the lungs to be clear. So if there are adventitious breath sounds, that may indicate the patient has an infection. If the patient has infection, guess what? You're going to have to notify the surgery and the um, surgical team because guess what? Surgery is going to have to be canceled. So the most important thing is going to be A. Choices B, C, and D are great nursing interventions, but it doesn't take priority. Our priority at this time is listening to those lungs, making sure the patient doesn't have an infection so we can know if the patient can still have surgery or not. Before administration of preoperative medications, the nurse is preparing to witness the patient signing the operative consent form when the patient says, I do not really understand what the doctor said. What action is best for the nurse to take? A, provide an explanation of the planned surgical procedure. B, notify the surgeon that the informed consent process is not complete. C, administer the prescribed pre-op antibiotics and withhold any ordered sedative medications. Or D, notify the operative room staff that the surgeon needs to give a more complete explanation of the procedure. And the correct answer is B, you need to notify the surgeon that the informed consent process is not complete because if the patient still has question, is it informed consent? No, she's not informed. She has questions. She, she still doesn't understand. Under no circumstances are you, the nurse, going to explain the procedures because you'll be stepping out of your scope of practice when it comes to um, informed consent. That is the job of the physician. Your job as a nurse is to do two things. It's to witness that the consent is informed and to put the informed consent in the chart. That is it. The patient has questions about, you know, the surgery, the details of the surgery, the adverse effects, what can possibly happen during the surgery, what might happen if she refuses surgery, all that good stuff the surgeon has to explain. Okay. Your job is to make sure that the consent is informed and you put it in the chart. So let's say you go through the whole process, the surgeon explains everything, the patient understands, they sign, and you go to put the informed consent in the chart, and then you notice that the patient was medicated for the surgery before they signed the consent. Is this informed consent legal? No. Guess what? You're gonna have to let your supervisor know because surgery is gonna have to be canceled. We're gonna have to wait until that pre-op medication has cleared from that patient system, that they have a clear mind, they have no kind of um, um, mind-altering drugs in their body, and you're going to have to go through the whole process again. So the only thing you can do is be notify the surgeon. Let them know that consent is not informed. That surgeon is going to have to come back and explain everything in detail and answer any questions. Which topic is most important for the nurse to do? discuss preoperatively with a client who's scheduled for a colon resection. A, care of the surgical incision. B, medications used during surgery. C, deep breathing and coughing techniques. Or D, oral antibiotic therapy after discharge home. The correct answer is C, deep breathing and coughing techniques. You have to talk to that you have to talk about that to the patient before surgery. You need to let them know what is going to be expected of them immediately after surgery. Mr. Such and Such, we don't want you to get an infection such as pneumonia. We don't want you getting sick. So after surgery, we're going to expect you to turn, cough, and breathe deep. If you in pain, we'll give you analgesics for that, but we are going to need you to do this. And you're going to show the patient how they're going to be turning, how they're going to be coughing, how they're going to be breathing deeply. Our other choices, such as one, care of the surgical incision, that can be taught after surgery. B, medications used during surgery. The surgeon is going to be talking to the patient about that, not you. And choice D, the oral anesthesia. Oral antibiotic therapy that's going to be used to discharge, that can be taught after surgery. But before surgery, you definitely want to teach the patient what they're going to be doing and what they can expect after the surgical procedure. A 24-year-old who takes a diuretic and a beta blocker to control blood pressure is scheduled for abdominal surgery. Which patient information is most important to communicate to the healthcare provider before surgery? 
A, a pulse of 59. B, a hematocrit of 35. C, a blood pressure of 142 over 78. Or D, serum potassium of 3.3. And the correct answer, guys, obviously is that potassium. Your potassium is supposed to be 3.5 to 5. Anything less than 3.5, we're going to be dealing with dysrhythmias because remember, hypokalemia causes muscle and nerve flaccidity, right? And anything more than 5, hyperkalemia, can also cause dysrhythmias, right? It can cause muscle and nerve excitation, excitability excuse me is it your heart a muscle yes it is right how do we kill inmates that are on death row in the state of florida that's where i live potassium okay so you know potassium has a very narrow therapeutic range 3.5 to 5 anything less or anything more can potentially kill the patient so that potassium level of 3.5 must be reported immediately to the physician Okay, let's look at our other choices. You have A, a pulse of 59. Your regular pulse is 60 to 100. So the pulse of 59, yes, it's outside of the norm, but remember the patient's getting a beta blocker, so that may be what dropped it down to 59. It is a concern, but not as much as a concern as the potassium that can likely kill them. Then you have the hematocrit, 35%. That's within normal range. That you blood pressure, 142 over 78. Yes, that's slightly high, but the patient's about to have surgery. That can be the reason for um, that slightly um, elevated uh, blood pressure. Yes, it needs to be addressed, but it's not going to kill them like that potassium is going to kill them, right? So potassium is going to be our priority. 10 minutes after receiving the ordered preoperative opioid by IV injection, the patient asked to get up and go to the bathroom to urinate. The most appropriate action by the nurse is to A, assist the patient to the bathroom and stay with the patient to prevent falls. B, offer urinal or bedpan and position the patient in bed to promote avoiding. C, allow the patient up to the bathroom because, because the onset of medication takes more than 10 minutes. Or D, ask the patient to wait because catheterization is performed at the beginning of the surgical procedure. I'll give you guys a moment to think of your answer while I reach over for my coffee. So the correct answer, guys, is B, you're going to offer a urinal or bedpan and position the patient in bed to promote voiding. This patient just got an opioid, IV, right? So it's gonna take that amount of time for it to get in the patient's system, okay? They are at a high risk for falls. We are not going to risk that patient falling just to ambulate them to the restroom. They're gonna go ahead and use the urinal right there. Choice one, assist the patient to bathroom. No, that patient is at too high risk for fall. They're about to go into surgery. C, allow them to the bathroom because the onset of med takes more than 10 minutes. No, it doesn't. This is given IV. The action is immediate. Choice D is completely inappropriate. Tell them to hold it because when they go down um, to the surgery uh, center that they're going to be catheterized. That's inappropriate. And guess what? We don't want them having a full bladder anyway. So we're going to allow them to empty their bladder, but they're going to do it via um, uh, urinal right there at the bed because we want to prevent falls. The clinic nurse reviews the CBC results for a patient who's scheduled for surgery in a few days. The results are WBC 10.2, hemoglobin 15, hematocrit 45, Platelets 150, which action should the nurse take? A, send the CBC results to the surgery facility. B, call the surger, surgeon and anesthesiologist immediately. C, ask the patient about any symptoms of recent infection. Or D, at, uh, discuss the possibility of a blood transfusion with the patient. And the correct answer is one. You're going to send the CBC results to the surgery facility. Surgery is going to happen. The only thing that is, and when I say slightly, I mean slightly abnormal, is a WBC. Your WBC is supposed to be 5 to 10. This patient is 10.2, okay? That's not enough to cancel surgery, all right? 
Our other choice is B, call the surgeon and anesthesiologist immediately. Let's say the WBCs were out of range where we suspect the patient has an infection. You would be calling the surgeon. You'd be calling the doctor, not the, the surgeon and the anesthesiologist. So that would have been wrong anyway. Choice C, ask the patient about any symptoms of recent infection. That wouldn't be necessary. We got the WBCs right there looking at us. And choice D, discuss the possibility of blood transfusion. Why? They're hematocrit and hemoglobins within normal range. There's no sign and symptom of that patient bleeding out. So the correct answer is one. We're going to go ahead and send the results down to the surgery center so they can get the surgery. As the nurse prepares a patient, as the nurse prepares a patient the morning of surgery, the patient refuses to remove a wedding ring saying, I've never taken it off since the day I was married. The nurse should A, have the patient sign a release and leave the ring on. B, tape the wedding ring securely to the patient's finger. C, tell the patient that the hospital is not liable for the loss of the ring. Or D, suggest that the patient give the ring to a family member to keep. So the correct answer is B, take the wedding ring securely to the patient's finger. And let me take this a step further. Yes, you're going to tape it to the finger, patient's finger, but you need to also document this in the preoperative checklist. Okay. Um, all the other choices, there's no need. Num a, having the patient sign a release to leave the ring on. And no, there's no need for that. C, telling the patient that uh, the hospital is not liable for the loss of the ring. Um, that's inappropriate and there's no need for that. And of course, choice D, suggesting that the patient give the ring to a family member to keep. They just told you they're not going to take it off. So there's no need for that. Let them keep it on, but you're going to tape it so it doesn't fall off during surgery. And you're going to document it on the pre-op checklist. <coughs> Excuse me. A patient's to receive atropine before surgery. The nurse teaches the patient to expect A, dizziness, B, weakness, C, dry mouth, or D, forgetfulness. The correct answer is C, dry mouth. How do we know this? We're talking about atropine. What is atropine? Atropine is an anticholinergic. Now, if you guys remember the poem I taught you about anticholinergics, when patients take anticholinergics, they say, I can't see, blurred vision. I can't spit, dry mouth. I can't pee, urinary retention. I can't shit, constipation. Those are the side effects of anticholinergics. So, of course, dry mouth, choice C. The nurse is obtaining the health history for a patient who's scheduled for outpatient knee surgery. Which statement by the patient is most important to report to the healthcare provider? A, I had a heart valve replacement last year. B, I had a bacterial pneumonia six months ago. C, I have knee pain whenever I walk or jog. Or D, I have a strong family history of breast cancer. The correct answer is A, I had a heart, a heart valve replacement last year. Patients who have heart valve replacements or anything, anything that's foreign to the body, such as a knee replacement, anything that's been placed in the patient's body that's foreign, but especially the um, heart valve replacement, they're at risk for what? Endocarditis, okay? That infection of that layer, inner layer of the heart. So any patient that's had a heart valve replacement and they're about to have a surgery, it doesn't even matter what kind of surgery. If they had that heart valve replacement and they're going in for surgery for anything, guess what they're going to need? Prophylactic antibiotics. Because we want to make sure that bacteria in the patient's body doesn't creep up to the heart and clump up where that valve replacement is where those valves are okay so any patient that has had a heart valve replacement and they're going for surgery they're going to need prophylactic antibiotics so the surgeon is going to know in advance that the patient has had heart valve replacement surgery so the patient can get antibiotics in advance before they go into surgery 
Let's look at the wrong answer choices. B, I had a bacterial pneumonia six months ago. Well, that was six months ago. So we're not gonna cancel surgery. It's not something recent. It's not that this patient had this a week ago. This is six months ago. So the surgery can still go on. C, I have knee pain whenever I walk or jog. Well, duh, that's probably why the patient's having knee surgery now. And then choice D, I have a strong history of breast cancer. Well, that's sad. We don't want to hear that, but that doesn't have any effect on the surgery that the patient's going to be having at the moment. So what's most important to us is that heart valve replacement that that patient had in the past because they are going to need prophylactic antibiotics. Okay, guys, we're down to the last question. When the nurse interviews a patient who's to have outpatient surgery using a general anesthetic, which information is most important to communicate to the surgeon and anesthesiologist before surgery? A, the patient drinks three or four cups of coffee every morning before going to work. B, the patient takes a baby aspirin daily but stopped taking aspirin 10 days ago. C, the patient drank four ounces of apple juice three hours before coming into the hospital. Or D, the patient's father died after receiving general anesthesia for abdominal surgery. And the correct answer is D. Remember, I talked to you about this maybe on the first question that we covered. The patient's father died after receiving general anesthesia for abdominal surgery. That is going to be what's most important for us to know because our biggest indicator that a patient's going to have an adverse reaction to anesthesia is if they've had one before or a first degree relative such as a mother, father, brother, sister has had it. So this is what's most important for us to know. Let's look at our other choices, the wrong answer choices. You have A, the patient that drank three to four cups of coffee every morning before going to work. Well, that lets us know that after surgery, we're going to have to let that patient drink some coffee so they don't go through withdrawals or get that withdrawal headaches, that headache that patients tend to get when they don't get the coffee, such as myself. If you guys have been watching my videos for any amount of time and you know that I'm an avid coffee drinker, okay? I, I don't get my coffee. I've got an attitude. I'm upset. I have a headache. Don't bother me. All right. Choice two, baby. Uh, patient takes baby aspirin daily, but they stop 10 days ago. That is wonderful because we always ask our patients who are taking a baby aspirin for a heart condition, whatever it is, we ask them to stop taking the aspirin one to two weeks before their planned surgery. So they stopped 10, to, 10 days ago. That's wonderful. And then you have choice C, the patient drank four ounces of apple juice three hours before coming in. Well, it was within that three, it was with three hours before coming in and it's apple juice clear liquid. We're not concerned about it. It's not that much. We're not worried about that. The patient's going to aspirate. So we're not going to cancel surgery. So our biggest concern is the patient who had a first degree relative that had a horrible reaction to surgery that their father died from, um, getting general anesthesia. Okay, guys, I hope this video was helpful to you. If you guys appreciate that content that I'm bringing to you guys, please share my, um, videos i'm trying to get to my first 1000 subscribers so if you haven't done so all already please subscribe to this channel like the video go ahead and leave a comment if there's anything you'd like to see me cover uh thank you for spending this time with me i promise i'm going to keep them coming i'm going to keep bringing you guys um content and i'll see you next time